escape the nine to five and create your path to freedom. Hello, hello, and welcome to today's Corporate Escape Stories. These are episodes where I get to interview and speak to inspiring people that have left their nine to five jobs and created a freedom-based business to support them in living the life that they want. I am Lydia Lee, and I'm the reinvention coach and freedom instigator at Screw the Cubicle. If you're new here, welcome, and don't forget to hit the subscribe and notification bell button to be the first to know whenever I release a brand new video on this channel. And I can I cannot wait for you to meet my guest today, Remington Cooney. So Rem is a coaching client of mine, and I wanted to share his story as an academic who is crafting a new pathway for his work as an entrepreneur. Uh, and as an academic and coming from a linear background where he was kind of taught one trajectory of becoming successful, Rem has an incredible and inspiring story of how he embraced a growth mindset to step out of the world of academia to pursue a more freeing way to share his passion for mindfulness and meditation. So a little bit about Rem, he currently works at Stenden University and is an instructor and a module designer. He's a meditation teacher turned mindfulness coach and really passionate about creating ways to integrate mindfulness into higher education and into the everyday lives of the modern day life and world. And this is something that he does to help people really maintain productivity and navigate uncertainty and change without mentally exhausting themselves. So get relaxed, sit on a couch, get comfortable <laughs> like me, uh, and enjoy this conversation with Rem. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining me, Rem, today. I'm so glad that we get to be on the same side of the world, because usually when I interview people for uh, Screw the Cubicle TV, they're on another continent, and we're actually uh -huh. on the same time zone in the same island at the moment. In same Bali. island, yeah. Yeah, a difficult island to get to at this point in time as well. <laughs> Yes, but we're not too far from each other. But um, thank you for taking the time to share your story and, you know, share the experience, which I think uh, is really important for people not just to hear stories of like, here's what a successful business looks like, but actually really go through the process of, you know, and you are in this perfect stage of building your business, right? Seeing some momentum that is in your business. And I think this is a great mm -hmm. place to share because that's where a lot of people are at when they watch an interview like this is what can I do from where I'm at instead of, you know, emulating some one five years or 10 years down the success track, right? So yeah. um, it's going to be a very transparent conversation, which I know you're always up for, and um, I can't wait to dig in. So the first question I always love to ask because it gets gives us a little overview of something I'm very interested in when it comes to transitions, you know, and identity change mm. that can happen when we go through different sorts of transitions in different stages of life. Uh, so the first question for you is, how do you think your family and your cultural background has shaped your identity? And how has your own personal identity shifted as an adult today? Oh, we're going to the deep, digging, digging <laughs> deep, deep right deep from the right beginning. Right away. <laughs> oh, so my family and my cultural upbringing, how has it shaped my personality? Was the mm. first part of that. Um, yes. Well, you know, Lydia, that I, I grew up in Asia, so I'm originally from Australia, but I, um, my parents moved over to Singapore when I was very young, when I was five years old, and I grew up as an expatriate, you know, um, in, a, in a very lavish way like i mean it didn't start that way i think my parents were um very entrepreneurial and they took their business over to singapore from adelaide australia and started from scratch pretty much so they built you know i've seen i've witnessed my parents build something from nothing and it was amazing it was really incredible i have um i'm so thankful to have witnessed that because i think it shows the potential it's made me who i am in terms of believing that something can be built from nothing um, but also being overseas and growing up overseas away from my homeland um, put me into a quite an early on existential crisis in that I didn't really know um, where home was. And I always mm. had this feeling like I wanted to go back to Australia, I wanted to go back to Australia like that, as if that was because it was my roots. You know, I was born there. But it, when I finally went back for university, you know, I'd grown up in Singapore, I'd done all my schooling in Singapore, finally went back for university. It didn't feel like home anymore. Like I didn't really relate to the culture. I didn't really relate to the people. And that was really interesting because what that did for me is it, it created um, the seeking spirit. Or as they say mm. in Zen Buddhism, the wayfinding spirit. Um, right. How to find what, you know, in Eastern philosophies they call the way, which is this path. And it's really the path of our life. What, what path in our life is most meaningful to ourselves and also to others? 
And being at a bit of an existential loss and, and not really fitting into Australia put me into that path, like drove me into that path. And so from that point on, I started to travel. From that point on, I didn't pick one place as home and I started to move around the world. And that eventually brought me to, to Bali, where I am now. So I've gone from Australia to Canada, spent a little time in Japan, went to Malaysia, and now have ended up in Bali. So in a way, it's like, um, I think, yeah, being brought up as an expat or as they sometimes say, a third culture kid, um, seeing through my parents what's possible um, when you believe in something, you know, having a, having a dream and traveling for that dream has made me nomadic. It's made, it's inspired my way seeking mind. And um, at times it's frustrating because I still yeah. haven't found home and I don't have a settled community, but it's also who I am. It's opened me to the world. It's opened me to my path. Mm. I love that you speak about that because as a as someone who's who came from an immigrant family, you know my family's originally from Penang, Malaysia, mm -hmm. right? And I grew up a little a little bit in Penang and a little bit in Canada, right? Mostly in Canada, and then I, we immigrated when I was about ten years old. And I certainly feel that uh, kind of very similar to how you felt this existential crisis pretty early mm -hmm. on in my in my early childhood um, of trying to fit in and belong to a Western culture, but also still having a foot in the Chinese Malaysian culture and being really mm. embarrassed sometimes of what my parents would do when they came for teacher parent meetings and things like that, you know. Um, and then mm. also as an adult, in a lot of ways, like what is my identity? What is my what if I had children? What are some of the cultural and um, interesting traditions that I would? Um, you know, share with my kids when I now have almost a third piece of home, right, which is Bali, for example, yeah. and having sort of like what and, and also even coming as an adult um, at the moment, it's like, how am I redefining the definition of home for myself that maybe wasn't as traditional as I thought it should have been. So it's almost like I think the 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 journey of the way seeking right never really ends. <laughs> no, it doesn't. For most humans, right? Uh, and actually, and just maybe part part of the the easing of that anxiety is embracing that we're ever, we're ever changing humans and ever evolving, and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even if you do have a settled place and a settled community. Um, there we are ever changing like there's nothing that ever really stays the same so the way seeking mind doesn't just come to those who travel but it should be inspired in everyone because everyone mm. is on some form of a path but i think people like you and myself we kind of go full into that that experience we're, we're really living out that way seeking mind in, in new and pioneering ways but the, mm. everyone has that everyone has that potential yeah. Well, let me let me talk to you about a little bit about um, talking about shifts and, you know, identity changes and um, finding your way right where it appears, you know, our, our way is sort of in different categories, if you will, in our life. Right. There's uh, our purpose. Right. There's also our purpose when it comes to other people and what we create in terms of community and family. Uh, and then career, obviously, is a big, big part of our identity that we can hold on to uh, for quite a long time. And also whenever there is uh, an opportunity to make a shift of, you know, taking the leap from corporate to entrepreneurship or changing courses when it comes to our vocation, right, or our job titles. Like, mm. that can be a very daunting experience for a lot of people because we, we hold a lot, we put a lot of weight and value in how we talk about who we are in the world, which is usually answering the question of what do you do? And if you're going to yeah. do something different than what you did 10 years ago or five years ago, yeah. it's really hard to go, who am I if I'm not going to say that job title anymore? And so yeah. you came from um, a, a background uh, in academia, right? And academia and academic professions, I find, have even more weight <laughs> to these job titles and a way of operating at work, a way of collaboration, a way of creating ideas that are very set in stone in some ways. Like, you know, when I work with academic clients in the past, uh, you know, one of the, the challenges sometimes they'll tell me about uh, taking the leap to entrepreneurship is that they, they kind of don't have the boundaries they used to have in academia. Like when you write a, a paper, for example, you have to really do so much research and because you're so afraid of judgment and yeah. peer crit critical uh, remarks from peers, yeah. everything has to be footnoted really perfectly, you know, uh, and yeah. there's sort of rules of what you play by in academia that makes you um, someone promotable, right? Someone that will get to a, a better role, right? Which is slightly different from entrepreneurship where you get to dictate in a lot of mm. ways uh, what those opportunities are for you. So I, I'm curious to learn, like, what is what has been kind of the most challenging thing about shifting from 
from academia environment to kind of creating work as an entrepreneur. Um, and what has now kind of shifted for you since to allow you to feel that you can indeed start a business and you can indeed be a business owner? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So I think um, in academia, yeah, academia is really, as you said, centralized around critique. You know, part of being an academic is to have a, have a critical mind, to sharpen the mind, to be critical, to assess and be rational. And something about entrepreneurship is a belief in, in, in a dream, like a belief in something that might at the time not seem realistic, but it becomes um, realistic as you go along. You kind of have to have faith in this path. It's again, the way seeking mind, it comes back to what we were talking about. So you got to have mm. faith in, in something that you can't quite envisage right now, but you know it's, there's a pathway towards it. In academia, I think with that critical mind, it's very easy to say, well, these are, and this is not every academic, this is just the way that we are trained, I think, in education all around, whether it's primary school, high school, or higher education. We're trained to sort of um, critique things. And if you're completely critical of your dreams, you can always poke um, loopholes in them. You can always find flaws right. in your dreams. And so I noticed that with entrepreneurs, um, especially being in Bali, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, they're not as risk averse, you know, like people who you see long term in academia are very risk averse people. They're like, they, you know, they've got tenure um, finally, which is always hard to get. And they, um, they want to just settle in that job and they'll be very critical and yeah, not take big risks. And so one thing for an academic to become an entrepreneur is to, to start to, to put this critical mind aside and to be willing mm -hmm. to, to indulge in your dreams a little bit. And obviously entrepreneurs are not just dreamers. They have um, very uh, rational sides to them, but they have to be a little bit idealistic, a little bit glass uh, half full rather than half empty. And I think for mm -hmm. me personally, I'm noticing where I get caught in that critical mind. I think when I first was signing up to work with you, I was like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to do this, um, you know, because I was like, is it really me? Can I really be an entrepreneur? Can I really follow this through? And I had to work right. with that mi mindset. I had to go from a fixed mindset, as they call it, to a growth mindset. Maybe you've heard that term before. Mm. And a growth mindset is, is to see that your um, current limitations are, are not permanent, that you can expand yeah into potential like you have potential to grow it's not like you're stuck with your current capabilities so if i don't know how to run a business yet that doesn't mean i'm not a good business person it just means right. i don't know how to do it yet so right. a lot of this growth mindset is is really important for entrepreneurship and i don't see that so much in academia mm. and what have been some of the like you know because i know you're a big a big person about you know rituals and practices it's kind of the buddhist mm -hmm. mindset isn't it that yeah. to become who we want to become it's not an overnight thing uh we have to sort of prepare our environment prepare our minds prepare our hearts right uh and rituals mm -hmm. have been kind of an interesting um uh strategy if you will like if you want to call that a strategy right like it's like yeah, a, a way could. that you know a pathway to do something more easily to uh, uh, to uh, allow and nurture new habits to uh be in reality in your world like what has been what have like in order for you to shift that sort of fixed mindset and critical mindset into more of a expansive growth mindset what what are some of the practices that you believed really supported you in making that jump you know, like rituals are so important in creating a sense of foundation and stability. But our daily routines, our rituals, we can get attached to those as well. So mm. in, in my training, you know, in the Buddhist training and the meditation training that I've done, um, there are very fixed rituals that we go through. And the belief is that by doing these fixed rituals, um, you don't waste your mind energy in like the morning or in, in the critical times when we do them, you don't waste your mind energy on um, getting sort of uh, having to make decisions. And that keeps more mind energy for creative processes. It, it, it allows you to yeah. expand when you need to expand because you haven't wasted all that mind energy on decision making. But um, when I came to Bali, I realized I really needed to let go of a lot of these rituals that had sort of formed my life because those rituals were no longer serving me. The morning mm. routines I had, the structure of the way I was thinking in the day, that had to be let go of because I'd gotten to a point where important rituals were no longer, uh, they were no longer there to, to serve and uplift me. They were there just because I was attached to them. So right. what, that, what that meant was reinventing this concept of, 
of ritual and, and being a bit more flexible. I think one thing that Bali has taught me moving here is just flexibility, that it is important to have your routines. But I, you know, I see it all the time here as well, actually, people who have arrived and they have these really structured, um, they want to they wanna, uh, develop themselves, right? They want to be the best optimal human they can possibly become. So they've created a yeah. schedule that's completely fixed. I'm going to go to the gym at this time. I'm going to do this at this time. I'm going to you know, do my uh, you know, affirmations at this time and nothing's going to get in the way. <laughs> And it's right. so contrary to the to the whole point of pra- the whole point of practice, the whole point of development and and optimization of ourselves is is I've realized a lot to do with flexibility, acceptance, and and mm. setting intentions to have structure, but also be willing to just let them go. That's a growth mindset as well to be willing mm. to let go of your fixed structures so that you can see new opportunities, so that you can pivot. You can't pivot if you're just so bound to to ritual and structure that you will never, ever, ever change. And that's, that's, a, that's a balance that only one can find in themselves and in their own lives. Mm. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because sometimes rituals can be really helpful and valuable. And then there, there are certain practices and rituals that were, as you say, that attachment you know, to a schedule, a routine that keeps us safe because we can control that schedule and yeah. routine, right? Uh, but it's yeah. having that additional mindfulness, right? Um, which is what you teach, right? You're, you are a mindfulness coach, right? That sort of go, yeah. let's not blindly just do things because we think we have to do them, but also really like look and see and, and assess whether whether or not what we used to do or what we are attached to or the habits and rituals that we're used to doing is actually supporting us to get to that next stage of who we're supposed to become, exactly. you know, and, and exactly also letting it. go, yeah. right? And not feeling yeah. like a failure when we we are letting go of certain things. Because I think sometimes the, the idea of letting go or the idea of doing something different can feel a little bit like, oh, does that mean that everything I used to do five years ago was false? You know, did I waste my time? Mm-hmm. Did I mm-hmm. screw it all up? And now I, I have to rebegin again. Like there's an interesting thing about, you know, when people let go of, of old jobs or let go of an identity of a corporate career, that it can kind of come with a feeling of um, failure when it actually doesn't have to be in, in that frame of mind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a time to let things go. So that's the same for our routines, the same for our jobs. Um, there is a certain time when we are going to evolve and that might mean leaving the corporate job or leaving the thing that we're wanting to, We, in our soul, know we want to leave, but in our human mind or our ego mind, we're so attached to. Um, yeah. I think that goes, that's a rule of thumb that kind of goes for everything because, you know, again, coming back to that Buddhist tradition, there's one uh, tenet that Buddhism really is founded on and that is um, that everything's impermanent. And mm. the beauty of life, the beauty of the job you have, the beauty of the work that you're creating is it's, it's not going to be forever. So this moment is so important to, to be in that. And then it, when it's time to let it go, my, my teacher used to always say this, my meditation teacher, he said, um, when it, you know, enjoy it while it lasts. And when it's time to let it go, just let it go. Just let yeah. it go. <laughs> yeah. And you can just bless that experience on its way and go, I'm welcoming new ones that are coming on my way, right? It's, it's an abundant mm-hmm. mindset as well, rather than um, letting go and it won't be filled with anything good anymore, right? <laughs> exactly. You <laughs> hope so, right? To realize. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, so you're, you're currently in sort of still in transition in a lot of ways. And that's why I really wanted yeah. to get you to talk about this because sometimes when people watch, um, you know, case studies and examples they find on the internet, so either someone, you know, that's already really successful, you know, that has done it all and it kind of feels too far of a reach as well, you know, and there's not enough conversation I find about the state of a crossroad, you know, at mm-hmm. a moment of like, hey, I'm still in my corporate job and mm-hmm. I'm launching a business, you know, cause sometimes people think it's either or, you know, do I have to quit my job to launch a business, you know, or can I do it in conjunction with each other? Right. Um, or is it one or, or the other? Right. And sometimes yeah. it's never, it's very, I find it's, you know, everyone's pathway is so unique and, and specific to who they are. And it should be that way that actually there is no one, one blueprint of how you gain freedom and, and do a business. Right. There's multiple pathways of how we make this work, depending on our risk tolerance, depending on uh, what responsibilities we have. Right. Whether we have a family yep. or we're single and kind of can make decisions more on the fly. Um, and also, you know, how we ease ourselves into conflict 
confidence because not everyone's willing to just give up a secure paycheck and hope our you know hope hope on a dream that might may or may not work out for them right and i think that was a really important conversation you and i had together before we started coaching together is that mm. you wanted to do this safely you wanted to do this mindfully and mm. you know you you wanted to make sure that actually you're able to almost match up the experiences as much as possible while you're working in the university you're working with that actually even decisions that you're making you know in that university aligns with the future you right yeah. that can benefit from these decisions which i think exactly. uh, is really really cool to to kind of uh, approach now you know, since kind of coming on, uh, you know, coaching with me, being a part of the nine day launch, um, you know, what's been really, uh, really fun to watch uh, as someone who's been coaching you for a few months is that, you know, you have really uh, like stepped up, like who you were when you talked to me about, I don't think I can do that thing, or I don't want to market mm. that way, you know, to who, what you've sort of taken reins on, you know, these days uh, have been like night and day, right? And I'm sure that came with a lot of process and progress, um, you know, but, but, you in a way haven't even finished 90 day launch yet right like we haven't even completed no. the program yet you're just about to get to the i think the last module and the our last, last coaching phase, session yeah, yeah it's yeah. like the last you know home run uh but right. what's important to to kind of mention is that actually you have built some pretty epic momentum for your business without being attached to this notion that you're not allowed to go after opportunities until you have a quote unquote successful and launched business right like mm. you didn't wait for your web website to be perfected you didn't weren't like oh my god i need my instagram channel or uh, my social channels or I, like all this credibility to be you know on my website in order for me to give myself permission to go after things in my business right so um yeah. From what I remember, you know, you have started to uh, partner with not one, but two really incredible businesses that have supported you in sharing your work, creating courses, right, as part of their programs. Like you've pitched to those people uh, when you didn't even have a course ready just yet, right? Yeah, um, that's right. You've also uh, been on, uh, you know, on, as a guest on podcast shows and started sharing your voice, you know, ahead of time, even though I knew like you weren't even quite sure what to say in the beginning but you just said yes and figured it out on the way, right? Kind of figured out what your voice sounds like, you know, if you were to be interviewed, for example. Um, and then yeah. you had, uh, uh, you know, a, a great time getting your first your first client that actually felt a lot easier than you anticipated <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of what, just, what it was to get a coaching client, right? Just came um, to me, yeah. Yeah, you know, and and it, it and it's not like you manifested it and just came out of the blue. There were certain things that actually kind of almost like, worked really well in your favor because of an imperfect action you took or a particular yeah. way that you planted the seed that felt less markety and a lot more authentic, you know, in the way you connect it with clients and with partners. So I would love to kind of hear like your experience of like, when you think about these partnerships you've created, you know, getting your first coaching client, saying yes to interviews and podcasts, even though you're not this, you know, fully established business owner yet, like, what do you think were some of the elements or things that you had to kind of embrace to support you in in getting these sorts of results? Part of it is just, I think, not trying to be the perfectionist, you know, uh, mm. in that having a fully packaged product, you know, one way to do it is to have a fully packaged product, as you said, and launch it and then start getting it. But what I was doing was as I was building this product or as I was cultivating the Tao of now, um, I was inviting people in to, to, to be in it, you know, and that's part of your course as well, you know, prototyping and, and inviting in, um, people to, to beta test the product. And so that was really important for me because it meant I didn't have to have something perfect. It meant I could kind of like figure it out as I go. I think there was some figuring right. out, just putting myself out there, putting out what I've done so far and seeing what comes back, putting out what I've done so far, you know editing it a bit, putting it out again, seeing what comes back. And so with the initial client, it was it was like, you know, through planting seeds um, some years ago, actually, that this person reached mm. out and I so happened, it just so happened to be perfect timing that I'd, I created this beta testing product. And I was like, yeah, let's try it out. I could have easily been like, oh, it's not ready yet or I haven't right. launched yet and come, come back to me when I launch. But I'm like, straight away, like, yeah, I'll take you on. I'll take the plunge. And it was just a, a series of taking the plunges with... Um, with Lito Academy, the same thing, you know, with Danny, it was just um, us connecting and us, us meeting, um, me reaching out and sort of us just resonating with each other, having similar ideas. And then 
him inviting me into, to, into creating something and me just taking the plunge again. And um, I, have, I had a tendency, and I still do, to, to have a bit of self-doubt that I'm not ready for something, like I'm not ready to do this, mm. or the product isn't good enough yet, or um, I'll be better in two years when this is sorted out, or that's sorted out, or when I'm not in a, in a job anymore and I'm fully focused right. on this. But life doesn't wait for those things, I've realized. So you just got to gotta go for it. And yeah, mm. I think that's part of what's been... Um, been really great with this building momentum is just going for things. Mm. And I and I love that you know when we talked a lot about um, marketing, like you know it doesn't have to feel daunting in a sense of that like mm. it looks like a, a piece of software or it means it has to be social media or it means that you have to have some fancy funnel you know that you can invite people into. I think a big part of um, what I think you know witnessing how you've sort of landed these. Uh, collaborations and really what they are are relationships aren't they you know they're not just mm. um uh you know partners i might I, just for the for the idea of profit you know and money uh it really is about like i like these people you know and and the first approach you took wasn't to go for the jugular like it wasn't like hi uh, hi danny i i'm you don't know me but i would like to work with you and i want to immediately want to be your mm. partner like doesn't work that way in real life, right? When we meet someone at a dinner party, if we were just immediately went and go, hey, do you need help? Do you want me to help you? Do you want to pay me? Like, they'll just tell you yeah. to, you know, like F off, right? Like, just go away. You are obviously yeah. have a hidden agenda, you know, of why you want to meet me, right? And I think the approach you took was um, a really genuine approach of like, I actually respect your business. I actually respect your work. And I just want to talk to you and actually share a lot of my experiences of my business. And then at some point, the conversation sort of landed into, hey, we could work together. Like we could, you might have something I need in my business. And then, you know, that fruitful uh, relationship kind of grows from there, right? Very much. I mean, yeah, I didn't have any intention to necessarily team up with Danny when I'd reached out with him. I just thought his interview with you was really inspiring. I just I sort of said that and then we just connected and then one thing leads to another. It's like, it's, you know, not, not dissimilar to um, romantic relationships. You don't go into, yes. <laughs> uh, some, maybe some people do, but you don't go in, on a date and go, are we going to get married at the end of this? Yeah. You know, are you, are you, <laughs> you'll scare most gonna, people away. <laughs> yeah, you'll scare most people away. And, and it's just that, that that's um, graspy energy, you know, when we have that graspy mm. energy where it, it becomes all about what, what can you do for me or um, this is all about me. And that's just, it's not mm. just a bad strategy, in my opinion, for business. Um, it's just a bad strategy for life because yeah. it, it just, it, it perpetuates this self story that we have that keeps us locked into our own problems and keeps us isolated when we're always looking at at the world through what does this mean for me and how do I get yeah, something from it? Yeah, like a transactional approach, right? Rather than a, a genuine yeah. connection approach. Yeah, I love that you said that. And and in a lot of ways, the the strategies that you know we talked about and you you ended up implementing, whether it's you know beta testing and you know what beta testing really means, it's a fancy word for basically going. How do we enroll and invite people, you know, to to collaborate with us, to build the thing with us, so that not only are we building something that people value that they've told us they would actually want to go through and you know uh, work on you with but it also is like hey I don't need to be the one with all the answers and I don't need to be a guru in the niche that I've chosen like I I actually would like to be more approachable more accessible and allowing people to kind of come in and test this out with me and get feedback right which is so important to remove that ego of being the know-it-all in our businesses which is a lot of pressure as well to begin with right and instead sort of yeah. go no 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 I don't know everything I have a loose framework of where I might want to take my work, but I need to validate that with some real human experiences, some real human feedback. Um, and, you know, I think that that is a is, is a much more um, authentic way, right, in alignment with people that want to do businesses in a, in a real human focused way, rather than like mm. thinking about, you know, these sort of technical business plans or technical ways of building a business, right? Um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about genius zones because as you know that's my jam right like my mission is mm. always about not building um any business right it's about building a business in alignment with what i call your genius zone which are your strengths the values you stand by and of course the personality type right that you have mm. um so i know that one of the inaugural kind of things you told me about or an obstacle that had kind of stopped you previously from believing that you know, you could market, you could share your business, you know, you're not a marketer, who am I to do that, right? Um, and, and you mentioned a lot about like, I have this 
you know, kind of battle between like making meaning and making money, you know, mm. and it almost looks like I have to get really good at making money in order to have a business, right? Mm. But I'm kind of sometimes hard to find like where the meaningful piece comes into play. And also perhaps from you witnessing a lot of the dig digital marketing activities going on on the internet that that also yeah. um, discouraged you a little bit, right? Of feeling like, oh my God, it has to be like that. And then I can be successful, right? Rather than perhaps there's a nuance there, perhaps there's a different way to approach that, right? Um, so how do you think, like, as you as you start building the foundations of your business, you know, brick by brick, when it comes to your offer, your partners, your clients, and really aligning that with your genius, so like, how, how have you kind of consciously decided on particular strategies or approaches or activities to kind of honor who you are in that genius zone? And mm. how different are you currently looking at marketing these days? Yeah. So when I started with you and when I, before, even prior to starting, I just saw it, marketing is so in your face because that's what we mm. see on social media is a very in your face approach. And I, yeah. I couldn't reconcile that with firstly my personality which is not in your face but secondly with the practices that I teach which are very subtle and are very humble and not in your face <laughs> so it's like how do you bring those two together so you know you reassured me that there's an organic form of marketing as well where people just get to know you through say word of mouth or um through sort of yeah speech and 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 also just conversation. doing events conversations doing events that event yeah. sort of spreading and, and the word coming out from that, maybe working with someone who organizes the event and they promote you and, and so that you don't have to market, they do the marketing. Those are all strategies that work really well for me um, mm. because my genius zone, I wouldn't say is, is marketing. And so working with someone who does have a genius zone in marketing um, is, a, is a great benefit. But also I found that people just know me as the guy who does this because not because I'm having, I'm threading it into every conversation, but because I'm really passionate about my work and because it, mm. my brand and what I do makes up so much of, of me. It's like my Tao of now is an extension of me and it's my work. I couldn't be doing anything else. I could only be doing this. I feel like that's what I'm sort of born to do. So it kind of emanates that way that when I'm in conversation, people ask me what I'm doing and I explain it. it it's like, just explaining my personality and so right. people I've realized over the time that I've known people and they've asked about who I am and what I'm doing and all my friends they know me as the guy who's the mindfulness coach who's leading the mindfulness courses at the university who has some um, online meditations and that's become somewhat of an identity so I didn't believe that that alone could could promote me but it turns out mm. it can because you know when my friend <laughs> called me up and said um, you know, my fiance needs some, some coaching. Um, she had remembered that three years ago, that was my brand. Like, that's what I do. So it, it's right. funny. I, I think that's one way that I, I've realized my, my perspective towards marketing has shifted is it doesn't have to be putting things up all the time on social media and being in your face. But that being said, mm. I think there's a real value to that kind of marketing. There is a value to being present, to having an online presence, to having a great Instagram account. And I am working on that as we as we've discussed but um it's not the be all and end all and it's not like well at least i i believe that now and i hope this stands true through the the coming years of running the business but um i don't have to be competing with other marketeers if that's the word um mm. to be on on the home page i can you know there's other ways yeah i think it, it's great to realize that like um even a conversation and a referral is a marketing engine. Like we forget yeah. that we almost put it in like its own little bucket. Like, oh, that's like if I got lucky, right? Like yeah. none of this has happened by luck. Like even your connection to your partners, that connection to that fiance of one of the people that knew you three years ago, it was because mm. of a prior seed you planted three years ago, right? That mm -hmm. really mattered mm -hmm. to you being passionate about the work, talking to her about, right? Something really important around anxiety or stress. And then when she was ready, you know, she thought about you, she remembered you. And it wasn't by luck or a magical manifestation of the universe. Mm. It was you actually just being yourself and you didn't realize it was a marketing activity three years ago, right? But it was simply through great conversations, you know? Um, it really reminds me of like one of the books I love recommending for coaches called The Prosperous Coach by Rich Litvin, uh, where he talks about, you know, sales being like, you know, when you think about 
if you're like, oh, my pipeline isn't filled with sales leads or enough people, you know, coming onto my coaching business is to then reframe the question as like, how many powerful conversations did I have this week? And mm. if the answer is zero, that's why. It's not because you have a bad marketing you know, strategy is that you're not, you're not having enough conversations. You're not talking about your work. So the world doesn't know about who you are. And it, and very likely mm. you're not even talking about your work to friends and family, <laughs> let alone the, the wild, wild west of the internet. Like even people around you are the, 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 the portal, if you will, to yeah. referrals, to telling someone about you. I mean, my first two years of my business was built upon referrals, word of mouth, and just me talking about work. I had no marketing strategy in the, you know, traditional technology form, but even getting on podcasts and doing all of that was by referral. It was me getting on one podcast first and then asking for a referral to a second one. And then that person mm. referring me to another one. And, and then it ripples effect. Yeah. It has this ripple effect of like, okay, all of a sudden my network's building and now I don't yeah. have to pitch as often, right? People come to me because they start to see the fruits of my labor, if you will, online with this, which is all these other episodes i filmed from five years ago right that still yep. bears fruit <laughs> seven years later yeah. right um exactly. yeah the conversations are real it is real yeah That's and i think um conversations we need to put more value on that because people are actually looking for genuine connection people are looking for being something more than just a number more than just an email list you know on your database they're looking to be understood they're looking to be listened to right so in a lot of ways your genius zone of um that that as you said the subtle approach right being a listener and being a, a considerate in how you respond to the needs of others um can only be done most powerfully through conversation you know, so mm. I'm not surprised that, that you're you're into that <laughs> and it works for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting just teaching as well at the university, having these students, um, younger people like in their early 20s who are looking for this genuine connection that we're talking of. They don't just want to mm. go into corporate work and, and, and work a job where there is a lack of human connection, like humanistic skills and this genuine connection and even the art of the subtlety of empathy that comes with that. Um, mm. they're back in, they're back in vogue because there's such a void of, of those skill sets or there's a void of people acting that out. And, you know, that's just in our everyday lives, but it's also in the business world, you know, I'm mm. teaching mindful leadership to the students and they're going to go into hospitality. They're going to go into business. They want to bring in the heart back into business. Yeah. They don't want to just be functioning with the head. And that's what we see with marketing. You know, we just see a lot of uh, formulas, algorithms and, and heady any ways of getting your business out there, but where is the heart in all this, right? We need to really yeah. reinstate the heart. I love that. Um, I'm so glad that you're doing the work you do because, you know, one of the things I said to you when we started working together is like how needed the work you're doing right now, especially in the day and age we're living in, because I think, as you say, right, on, on, on a collective way, you know, the world mm. is starting to understand that actually our well-being, our resilience, our emotional intelligence are actually assets that we can use mm. to really be ready for this new world of whether it's the future of work, which we're obviously currently in a big shift in transformation in how we work uh, during a pandemic, for example, right? Like we've had to adapt, you know, to new ways of doing things differently. And sometimes that human, you know, can uh, get a lot of stress and anxiety because change is hard majority of the times yeah. for humans in general right whether you're going through a large life change or even just the fact that you have to work from home and you've got kids in the background can cause a disruption in um our happiness you know and our, our balance and so the only thing we can control is not the external world of when the pandemic ends or when will i when will my boss stop being an asshole or you know all the external factors of what we believe our happiness are dependent on and what you're yeah. doing is sort of giving back control of, to the individual to be like yeah the all these things can still be happening like like this, this, you know, the, the drama could still be happening, if you will, in, in your world, but yeah. it's how you deal with it, how you experience it, how you react to it, that makes all the difference, whether you go through that drama, fighting, kicking and screaming, or actually, actually gaining some sense of resilience and comfort during that time, and even depending on yourself for that comfort. Um, what, what do you think it is the most powerful thing you teach people these days that are helping them navigate um, the anxieties of the unknown, 
the, the resilience they need to cultivate in change at the moment? Like, what are the, some of the things that you find most relevant and important to teach? Mm. I mean, the, in the coaching course that I offer, the one that I've developed um, through your 90 day launch, we're looking at three pillars. We're looking at the pillar of mindfulness. We're looking at the pillar of emotional intelligence. And we're looking at the pillar of leadership. And the mm -hmm. university course that I teach is, is very similarly modeled on that. And there are tools and techniques within those three pillars that I think um, are, fair, are very, very essential um, anyway, but are particularly essential at a time like this with the uncertainty. I always come back to the first pillar. And the, fir the first pillar of mindfulness is really the foundation in which these other two are kind of built off of. Um, it's, it's difficult. So the first pillar is mindfulness. And the, and the practice that comes with that pillar is meditation. Um, obviously, I'm biased because I'm a meditator, but I find that right. being being still, d just finding some sort of contemplative practice to be still, to go inwards, to reflect and be self-aware, um, does dividends for or produces dividends. I don't know what the saying is. Mm -hmm. Gives us gives back is what I'm trying to say. It gives back so much um, to us, and it gives us so much clarity because it's very difficult to change our behavioral patterns if we haven't taken the back step. And the back step is to sit still or to be quiet for a moment and to just reflect mm. without trying to fix something or get anywhere or solve something. It's just the settling of the mind's activity. And what we need more than ever right now is just time in our schedule, because we have very busy schedules generally, for the mind's activity to just settle down and, and to just sort of soften. And when the mind's activity settles and softens, the heart can soften. And when the heart mm. can soften, um, we have a greater capacity to work on the second pillar and the third pillar, which are emotional intelligence and, and leadership. So when the heart softens, we can extend that newfound empathy into the way that we are relationally responding to the world. And if we're emotionally intelligent in the way that we're relationally responding, we can be better leaders, whether that's mm. the leader of your family, whether it's the group leader in your WhatsApp group because you're going out for beers, <laughs> with your friends or whether it's like you're the CEO of the, you know, a fortune 500 company. It's like kind of all in my simple mind, it comes down to those three pillars. And it starts with the mm. foundation of just being, just being still. And some people find that difficult to be in meditation and sitting still, but there are other ways mindfulness can be done through nature walks. It can be done through yoga and Tai Chi. You can go to the beach and you can go to the gym and do mindfulness. So yeah, just stilling the mind, like bringing the activity down. I think that's the number one mm. essence of if I could distill what I what I teach. It's like do that. Yeah, I, I love that. It's such a actually a very simple thing, right? And and because the word mindfulness can be like, oh, I'm not a, a Buddhist monk, so I'm not going to do that, mm. right? And I remember thinking that a lot because it was as a high achiever, as someone who is a perfectionist, and um, you know, I come from a family of overthinkers, it was really difficult to actually just sit on a cushion, put my incense on and ring the monk bell, you know, and just sit for even yeah. five minutes. And where I found I now am able to do more uh, meditative practices that are deeper, is actually starting with something a little easier, which is actually mm. walking. Walking in nature is a beautiful way to kind of ground yourself to something rather than your burdens, you know, and, and you take in that environment and the sounds and the smell and the sight of something external and beyond yourself. Um, another way that I've really loved uh, getting getting into the zone of mindfulness without knowing I've done it is um, la swimming, swimming laps. You know, swimming mm, yeah. in general, just like it's just the repetitiveness of the activity. I'm a breaststroker, if you can't see from my <laughs> from my movement. <laughs> That's all I know how I'm to do. Back, I don't I'm know how to do. Stroker. Yeah, I, I don't know how to do the other one. I just know how to breaststroke. But it really just that repetitiveness. Yeah. You know, I don't know something about that really clears my mind. Maybe it's not the first lap, but it's definitely on like the tenth lap. All of a sudden, yeah. I'm in that zone. You know, and so yeah, I really love that you broke it down to. It can be simple. You can do it in a way that actually you can do it. You know, most realistically at this moment, without believing you need to be a Buddhist monk. And then the whole purpose and intention is just to soften rather than eradicate. Is to yes. soften. Yes, that's it. That's a great way of putting it. Just to soften rather than mm. eradicate, because. Love you know, it. the first impression people get when they think about sitting still and doing meditation is to eradicate all thoughts, but it's not the case. Yeah. You're not going to eradicate all yeah. thoughts. And 
we're in a, a, the, the hardest time to sit still and do meditation because we have so many distractions. We have so many interruption technologies. We have so much uncertainty. So um, finding a way to do it that's conducive to our being, whether, whether, whatever, whatever activity is, is important as well to customize it. Mm. And, you know, yeah. the coaching course then builds on that, you know, that we, if you're working with me, you go into then a bit more advanced kind of techniques like the think, feel, act, cognitive behavioral therapy technique, or we go into communication, empathetic communication strategies, how to have difficult conversations and ask the right questions. Mm. So it does get a bit more complex. It doesn't just sort of stay in that zone. I'm not just right. like meditate and that's it. Um, but that's, that's the starting point. That's the essence right. of it. And it, it's the one mm. thing I always suggest. I love it. It's almost like tying in, like, let's start with the heart and get you in a place of embracing a new reality and embracing calmness as you ease into that. And then we activate the, the brain, right? The st strategies like empathetic listening or right, building empathy yeah. and, and, and having leadership skills, uh, because you can't really get to strategy until the heart has sort of been in a, a nice place of like even welcoming, right? The new things that are allowed to be in your life. So I love that you marry a head and heart together. And since we come with yeah. both, very likely we need to activate both right <laughs> yeah that's it that's it exactly <laughs> great well thank you so much for sharing your story thank you for sharing uh, a little bit more about your work i think uh, mindfulness can be such a complicated uh theory for a lot of people and i think that's why i love what you do because you're really bringing it to the everyday modern day man and woman right now who doesn't want to live in a monastery for a whole year but want to have some contemplative practices to just feel a little bit less stress, a little bit less anxious okay. in their day to day. Um, how much. can, if people love this conversation and want to get in touch with you, maybe work with you or at least get into the vicinity of some of the concepts and philosophies you teach, what's the best way for people to connect with you right now? Yeah, so I'd love to do, you know, discovery calls with anyone who is interested in just um, hearing more about what I offer and how I offer it. People are wanting to learn these resilience techniques, these stress reduction techniques through mindfulness and emotional intelligence. My coaching course is available and um, they can access, uh, they can reach out to me through the DAOofnow.com, which is my website. There's a services uh, tab at the top of the website and you can directly email me and, and um, you know, if it's just a 20 minute call just to have a, a powwow about the work that I do or what mindfulness can offer, that's, you know, free of charge. And if there's anything more that they want to take it from there and and to work with me one on one, um, I'm available for that. Perfect. Um, and we'll put um, we're going to have a link for you. So Dao of now, D-A-O and then off now dot com. But we'll put a link uh, right. to visit that site as well. And then I think you also mentioned before to me about a couple of resources or tools that people can kind of get access to at the moment uh, that might be helpful to them to kind of get a, a gist of what mindfulness really is. What are, do you have any of those to share as well? Yeah. Also on that same website, um, I believe it's under the guided meditations. Uh, I think it's resources guided meditations tab. There's a few, uh, I think three or four um, meditation recordings that I have, and they're just free of free of charge as well. Like you can just go on there and listen to one of the meditations. Um, I have a couple of meditations up on Insight Timer as well. So there's another route to, to accessing um, basically what I do and what I teach. And I have to say, from going through some of Rem's meditations, his voice is very soothing. It is a very nice voice to wake up to in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for being so transparent, so honest and real about the whole process so far. And I'm excited to see what you're creating in the future. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Lydia. This is really a great conversation. Um, I guess, you know, because you've seen me through the whole process. So you've seen how I've transitioned and how I'm opening up into this uh, business owner of, of Dow of Now. Mm, yeah, proud mama bear today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Talk to you soon.